With me now, I want to bring in our first guest, is former U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder. He is the author of the new book, The Unfinished March, The Violent Past and Imperiled Future of the Vote, A History, A Crisis, A Plan. And Eric Holder was the Attorney General from 2009 to 2015, and it was under his leadership that the Domestic Terrorism Task Force was restarted in 2014. General Holder, I really appreciate you for being here today, and I can't think of a better person to kick off this conversation with, so thank you for your time. Well, thanks for having me, Simone. It's good to see you. Absolutely. Great to see you, sir. So, uh, since you, since 2020, there have been more than 850 mass shootings in America, and that's according to the, the guns, the, the group Guns Down America. That's where that stat came from. I'm wondering from you, what else could or should the DOJ be doing about this? Because you sounded the alarm when you were attorney general. Yeah, I mean, I think we clearly have to deal with the problem of, of guns and, and, and the need for additional measures of, of gun safety. There are, you know, over 350 million guns in the United States of America, too many in the hands of people who, who shouldn't have them. So that's one thing. Uh, I think we also have to deal with what I've come to call um, this recruitment of hate effort that we see uh, done through social media, through the Internet where people are being radicalized um, in, in a way that we have seen other people get radicalized for other causes. Now the focus is on you know, uh, racial and ethnic uh, terrorism. And so th th that combination of those two comes up with a really deadly brew. And so it is going to require vigilance on the part of the Justice Department, working with you know, their state and local partners to try to deal with those underlying causes. Again, getting at guns and, and getting at this, this hate speech that we see um, filtered out, not only on the internet, but then kind of hinted at in, in a more sanitized way, um, you know, in, in other places. You know, uh, General Holder, I'm so glad that you, you talked about both gun safety measures and addressing um, the prevalence of hate speech on the internet. This morning on Meet the Press, um, the mayor of Buffalo uh, spoke directly to this issue. I, I want to play this for you right now. Okay. I would like to see ending hate speech on the internet, uh, on social media. Uh, it is not free speech. It is not the American way. Uh, we are not a nation of haters. Uh, we are not um, a nation of, of hate. We need to send a message that there is no place on the internet uh, for hate speech, for hate indoctrination, uh, for spreading hate manifesto. General Holder, hate speech is not an actual legal term. People out there might not know that. The Supreme Court has ruled on this repeatedly, actually, that hate speech is protected by the First Amendment. My question to you is, should hate speech be protected by the First Amendment? We know that it is, but should it be? Sure. I mean, you know, speech should be protected. That is kind of a hallmark of the American system. On the other hand, when you are running a private company and you see that which, you, see, you know, the, the tools, um, the things that make your company great being used in ways that bring harm to individuals and to certain communities, there are ways in which I, I got to think there are tools that can be put in place, you know, to minimize. I'm not sure you're ever going to be able to eliminate, but to certainly minimize the amount of hate speech that that, um, that gets through those platforms and then gets into these receptive ears who, of, of people who then have access to these weapons and who do the terrible things that we saw, you know, in Buffalo today, but we saw, you know, in Pittsburgh before that, uh, and which we've seen um, around the country. And one of the things that really kind of struck me is I've heard people say, well, this is not about what Buffalo was about. This wasn't a part of our community. You know, this guy drove from 200 miles away or something like that. And we need to stop thinking that way. This is the American community that is being afflicted by this violence. And it, it, we can't just say it's over there, it's those people. No, this is us. When, so, when something happens in Buffalo, it has an impact on me here in Washington, D.C., and it ought to have an impact uh, on all Americans. Mm, I, I absolutely agree with you, sir. I want to move to the issue of voting rights, because yesterday on the show, uh, I did a whole thing about faith and institutions and in this, in this new book that you've written, it is not just addressing the issue or the crisis, if you will, that we are currently experiencing. You also talk about solutions. And I, I think it's fair to say that we have seen the current Attorney General Merrick Garland and the Department of Justice truly take steps to combat voter suppression. I can think of places like Texas, for example. But I'm wondering, do you think that they're doing enough? And if not, what more could they be doing? 
Yeah, I, I think they're doing um, a, a, as good a job as they can, given the fact that, you know, the primary tool that they have to work with, that is the Voting Rights Act of 1965, was gutted by the Supreme Court in the Shelby County decision um, in 2013. And that's one of the things that I talk about uh, in the book, the impact of the Supreme Court on our fight for voting rights. And it's why I, we propose some very specific reforms for the, uh, the Supreme Court. But it's also, you know, I think the book is important because we talk about similar situations in our history, similar times in our history when individuals, um, regular, ordinary people, so-called ordinary people, uh, banded together and dealt with the democracy threatening uh, problems in their time. Uh, and they did so successfully. And I'm really confident that with the proposals that are contained in this book and with a committed citizenry, we can get back to a place where we need to be in, in this country. Certainly the Justice Department has to do its part, but at the end of the day, it's going to be the American people who ultimately will bring about the needed change. Mm. I want to I want to talk about that, uh, General Holder, because you mentioned the 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 Shelby decision. It's Shelby v. Holder, and you are in fact the holder in uh, that case. And it strikes me that that was um, that was an inflection point for you. And Shelby v. Holder brought us to where we are right now, having this conversation about this book you just put out. And I'm wondering, where do we go from here? Yeah, what you said, your, your observation's a good one. I mean, the Shelby decision was really an inflection point for me. It really shook my faith. Um, in, in the Supreme Court. Uh, it really kind of had an impact on my confidence in the Supreme Court. After Congress had, you know, made all, done, conducted these extensive hearings, had voted almost unanimously to reauthorize the act after a Republican George W. Bush had signed for the reauthorization, the Supreme Court, I think on pretty specious grounds, uh, decided to, in essence, gut the, the, the Voting Rights Act. Well, I, I think where do we go from here? It means that we have to fight as best we can, uh, as we indicate in the book, at the, at the state and local level to put in place uh, people at the state and local level who will undo a lot of these restrictive voting laws, as was done in Virginia. People say you can't do that. Well, we know it was done in Virginia. Republicans put in a bunch of really restrictive and unnecessary voter ID laws. When Democrats were able to take power, they undid those laws. So we have to do that. But the federal legislation that was not passed uh, by this last Congress needs to be re reintroduced and ultimately, I think, repassed by having a, a set of federal standards and a revivified uh, Voting Rights Act, uh, we can really get to that uh, to that better place. So there are mechanisms in place. And I think if people look at the book and look at the history, you can understand that um, we should not feel that our situation is hopeless, that we have the capacity for the positive change that all of us seek. Mm, absolutely. Before I let you go, sir, I want to ask you um, about January 6th. You know, there are lots of folks um, who have been critical of current Attorney General Merrick Garland. Uh, they feel as though he's been slow to act in this J6 investigation. You, over the last uh, week or so, I think have been very clear that you think there's enough evidence to indict former President Donald Trump for his role in January 6th. But I I'm wondering about the other leaders in the Republican Party, specifically members of Congress. What are your thoughts there on possible indictments for them? Well, I think the investigation has to be as wide-ranging as it possibly can. And everybody who was involved in that coup attempt, because that's what it was, it wasn't a riot, it was a coup attempt on January the 6th, has to be held accountable. Uh, they need to be held responsible for what it is that they did. Uh, and that is the way we do things in America. But there also has to be, they have to be held accountable for the deterrent effect that it will have so that future leaders of our country will not think, even think about the possibility of trying to interfere with the the uh, the peaceful transfer of power, because that was their ultimate aim. And so whether you served in Congress, whether you served in the Justice Department, whether you were a high-ranking official who served, uh, you know, s s served uh, President Trump, all of those people need to be held accountable. And if the evidence is there, they all need to be um, prosecuted. Mm. Former Attorney General Eric Holder, thank you so much, sir. New book out. Y'all check out Eric Holder's book. Thank you for being here.